Welcome to everyone. I'm Jack Kupferman, president of Grey Panthers New York City, and we're here together to uh, honor the almost 200,000 nursing home lives that have been lost to COVID. We have not, as a nation, had the opportunity to grieve for these enormous losses. They're not comprehensible. And yet, we all know how important these lives have been. We need to make sure that their memory is never forgotten. Whether or not we're in a nursing home who've been isolated, they need to be able to be connected with us. The program tonight is really about love. We're so honored that so many people have wanted to share in this and provide moving testimonials from nursing home residents, staff of nursing homes, family members. There's been elected officials and clergy that want to help us along to make sure that we have an opportunity to honor and to grieve. As we're gonna to learn tonight, we'll all have better insight into who these people are. And we'll be able to acknowledge the loss, not only for them, but it's our loss as well. We know that out of grief can come healing and change. Nursing home residents, we don't always see them as the individuals that they are. Part of what we're doing tonight is to be able to humanize them, to make sure that we understand that no matter what, they have value and voice. My parents owned a small adult home in New York State. We called it the Garnival Home for Adults. We had 35 residents, we lived in the premises, and these people were our friends. My parents, Jean and my father, Erwin, cherished these people and always gave them the love and respect that they were entitled to. It's really an honor that we're able to continue that commitment here tonight. And it's important for us to remember that it's not only about loss, but it's about love. Let's make sure that we can come together to grieve and to begin the healing process. Thanks for joining us today. Greetings of grace and peace. I'm Reverend Lynn Castile Harper, the Minister of Older Adults at the Riverside Church in the city of New York. We gather together, people of good conscience, people of all faiths and no faith, united to mourn, remember, and honor the over 170,000 lives lost to COVID-19 in nursing homes in the United States. Each number represents a beloved individual, friend, spouse, parent, grandparent, co-worker, neighbor, cousin, aunt, uncle, neighbor, each individual is unique and sacred. In the Christian scriptures of my faith, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. May a deep comfort abide with all who need it on this day of remembrance. I light this candle in remembrance and reverence for each life. As we remember and lament, we also have hope as together we seek a more just, caring, and kinder future a future in which the most vulnerable among us are prioritized and protected. Light points us to a new day, the dawning of a new time in which our world is more just and peaceable. And so may the giver of all light be with us all, encouraging and strengthening us for the journey ahead. En estos momentos de luto, no sabemos 
necesitados, necesitados de consuelo, necesitados de una palabra de esperanza, de aliento. Tenemos la tentación al encontrarnos en esta larga noche nuestra de quizá maldecir esta noche, de desesperarnos. Así que hoy les invito a ustedes desde donde estén que prendamos esa luz que nos ha, se nos ha dado a cada uno de nosotros como seres humanos y nos unamos no a maldecir esa noche que nos asfixia sino de alguna manera que nuestra luz a la cual invocamos y la cual en la memoria de los más de 174 mil hermanos y hermanas que han fallecido en esta pandemia, en asilos, confinados al olvido y a la negligencia, en su honor, Prendemos esta luz, activamos nuestra luz como un gesto de solidaridad, sabiendo que somos semillas y sí que florecemos. más allá de esta orilla en la otra así que les pido que se unan conmigo no solamente en la oración sino en la acción y que por nuestra acción como acto de fe respetemos la memoria de nuestros seres queridos que han fallecido en estos asilos a través de nuestra nación. Que esta luz, la nuestra, la de cada uno de ustedes, alimente la esperanza y nos lleve por caminos de justicia y de misericordia. Amén. Hi, I'm Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and it's an honor to speak to you on this National Day of Mourning for nursing home residents and staff who have died from COVID-19. I want to thank Jack Kupferman and Gray Panthers and everyone who has worked so hard to put this day of mourning together. This last year has been devastating for so many older adults, their loved ones, and our nursing home and long-term care communities. More than 180,000 residents of long-term care facilities have died from COVID. That's one in every three COVID deaths in America. Many of you have lost friends and loved ones, and I'm deeply sorry for your loss. I'm grateful that you could join us today in remembering not only our nursing home residents, but also our nursing home workers. Nursing home staff across the nation are heroes who come to work every day under difficult conditions to care for our loved ones. And last year, death rates amongst nurse, nursing home staff ranked among the highest of any job in the nation. It's so important to pause for a moment to reflect on the lives we have lost and to commit to doing everything we can to honor their memories. For me, that means continuing the important work of getting our older adults and the people who care for them the relief, support, and resources they need and deserve. It's one of my top priorities as a member of the Senate Aging Committee. I worked to secure more than $1.4 billion in funding in the American Rescue Plan to strengthen Older Americans Act programs, including the OAA nutrition services and vaccination efforts. The American Rescue Plan also included nearly $8 billion down payment for the health force, my legislation to create a robust public health workforce to strengthen our vaccination efforts. And I will continue to raise your voices and concerns in Washington 
during our recovery and beyond. You can count on me every step of the way. Hi, my name is Vicki Elner. I was blessed to be the youngest of four children with three older brothers. My oldest brother, Larry, who was 10 years older than me, um, was someone who was in my life uh, constantly. And of course, there was never a day in my life that he wasn't in it because of the fact that he was 10 years older than me. The sibling relationship is one of life's longest lasting bonds, which ties us to our roots, shared experiences and memories. The connection we have with our siblings is hard to describe in one single word. The loss even more difficult to comprehend, your world changes in a heartbeat. So we played together, we worked together, we grew together, um, we were uh, friends, uh, we, were, we were comrades, uh, we were business associates, we traveled together for years uh, for business purposes. And he was just the most amazing, person uh, we would be sitting at the dinner table and something would strike us as funny and we would start laughing and literally my father even though we were adults would kick us out of the dining room um, and try to regain our composure something would be said or we would look at each other and it wasn't even uh, it was so um subtle that we picked up on it together because it was that connection and we would start laughing like children uh, and we were well into our like 30s and 40s when we were doing this and we'd be kicked out of the uh, dining room and we'd be laughing even harder when we did that um his loss is is devastating uh the loss of a sibling someone who you share experiences with um and even um uh, at our stage of life uh you don't think of the loss that you're going to have to encounter and, and what changes that happens to you. So uh, losing him, especially in such a horrendous manner, um, he died very quickly once he tested positive. Every day when I get up, he is my first thought. Grief is an interesting thing in as much as we think of stages of grief, but really grief is something that one day you're grieving and one day you're reconciling and one day you're remembering and one day you're denying they kind of shift depending on uh really what hits you and what your mood is or maybe something that sparked a memory cord and my memories oh my god i'm so grateful and thankful for my memories it is always too soon to lose someone you love you always wish for one more smile one more hug one more conversation one more secret one more joke and one more day, hour, or minute. You know, all I can think about is, um, you know, one day until we meet again, um, I will always keep his memory alive and my love will be, will always be there for him. It's very sad. You know, I, I mean, I could do this and my, my heart is breaking. It really is. My heart's breaking right now. I'm so proud to be part of this event um, and to be able to, um, you know, focus on this issue, um, you know, and honoring nursing home lives, uh, you know, and I realize that obviously with as many people have who have passed and their families, you know, there's so many people that are touched by this. And um, I just feel that, uh, you know, being, having this opportunity to be able to express and kind of be a voice for the families that have been affected by COVID-19 um, is, is an honor to do that. I have been an active, passionate, and committed advocate for issues related to our aging population for over two decades. This experience has made me even more of issues that need to be examined and changes that need to be addressed. In closing, when someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. I hope like me to all of you 
who have loved and lost, that you find beauty in what remains. Today, we honor the thousands of men and women who died from COVID while living in nursing homes. Though the statistics are startling, they don't convey the heartbreak of their dying alone, neither accompanied nor comforted by those they loved and who loved them. Every person's story and his or her inner life are as unique as are our faces. I'd like to tell you about three of the nursing home residents I was privileged to know 25 years ago, when working to help nursing homes grow from colonial institutions of anonymity into beloved communities in which each person became known and celebrated in life. As we were becoming a beloved community, staff learned for the first time that one man had owned and operated the tailor shop at the bus stop that the staff used. Then we learned that when Jesse Owens, an African-American, had won four gold medals in the Olympics in Berlin in 1936, our tailor, a German Jewish American, had won the silver medal. Once we learned of his bravery in Berlin in 1936, on every marathon Sunday in New York thereafter, we celebrated our own Olympic champion, naming Marathon Sunday after him. On the same floor, a formerly independent and confident bookkeeper had entered into the nursing home suddenly, following amputations of both legs and parts of both hands from a terrible disease. She had become understandably insecure, but the new strengths-based orientation prompted the social worker to discover that in addition to her suffering, she was also fluent in five languages. Her wise social worker convinced an initially hesitant woman to embark on a whole new profession. Before long, she was teaching English as a second language to four Russian-speaking housekeepers in the nursing home during their half-hour half lunch breaks. These became mutually enjoyable and rewarding experiences for both sides. You'll never guess, she would confide, what they want to learn how to say in English. There are many inspiring stories, but I'll conclude with this one. A man had been a highly decorated colonel in the U.S. Air Force in World War II. On Veterans Day, just two weeks before he died, all residents, families, and staff were assembled as his brother pinned medals on his chest, reciting each citation for bravery above and beyond the call of duty until his entire chest was covered with medals. All cheered and honored his heroism just two weeks before he died. In every instance before each person's story became known, their anonymity in the nursing home had seemed to erase their value to the human family. In nursing homes, as in life everywhere, it isn't, I think, therefore I am, but I am known, therefore I am. I am valued, therefore I am. I am cared about, respected, and loved, therefore I am. Although these heroes have passed away, they're not powerless. They speak to us still. They say, let people committed to social justice in every town and city across the land pledge allegiance that from now on, everyone who lives and works in nursing homes will live and work with liberty and justice for all. In nursing home transformation, the resident, the stone which the builders rejected, has become the cornerstone. Hi, I'm Ken Dykewald. I'm a psychologist, a gerontologist, and the CEO of AgeWave and became a Grey Panther in the 1970s, and I've been proud of that relationship. But I want to take a moment to talk about what we're here to be respecting on this special day. Uh, with the aging of America, we have more elders in nursing homes than any other time in history. You know, how sad that COVID-19 has taken nearly 200,000 souls in these settings. And how sad for the nearly one million family members, kids, grandkids, husbands, wives, who weren't able to tell their elder loved ones just how much they were loved, to exchange stories, to touch them, to hold them, and how much they'll be deeply missed. And how sad for the hundreds of thousands of big-hearted and, I should say, poorly compensated nursing home staff 
who found themselves not only caring for these fragile elders, many with cognitive loss, but also having to play the spiritual role of shepherding them into the final moments of their lives. This is a time to pause and share respect, some grief, and some regard for the sad loss we have just experienced in our nursing homes. I know that there's been loss and grief and terrible outcomes from COVID in every element of our world and our society, but it's been within the nursing homes where the highest concentration of sad effects have occurred. Hello, this is State Assembly Member Ron Kim from Flushing, Queens. Uh, last year around this time, on April 15th of 2020, I lost my uncle, Mr. Song Kim, at a local nursing home here in Flushing to presumed COVID. Song Kim uh, had dementia for many years and he was admitted to a local nursing home and he died alone, in pain, without any funeral, just like thousands of other families uh, at the time last year and the last several months who went through similar painful traumatic experiences. My uncle Song, he was one of the very first few uh, dentists of Korean American descent uh, in the city of New York. He graduated from NYU dentistry school uh, many decades ago, and he proceeded to join the U.S. Army, where he became a captain, and he practiced his dance dentistry in the U.S. Army. And as a captain in the Army, he sponsored uh, by family members, including my father and myself, to immigrate to this country from South Korea. So you see, without my uncle, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to get some of the best public education in the world. I would not have had the opportunity to go to college, grad school, and run for office and become an elected officials representing the very district in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And for him to die alone uh, in agony, to have sacrificed so much, to have so much, um, faith and uh, patriotism for this country, that for him to die alone, it's beyond tragic. And I share that agony with so many of my constituents and people around the state of New York that recognized early on last year that something wasn't going in the right direction. Why was uh, why did the governor send 9,000 COVID patients at the peak of the pandemic while giving out corporate legal immunity to some of the worst nursing home executives just around this time last year? Uh, why, did he, why did he suppress uh, and defraud the, the public with valuable nursing home data while promoting a book that that he secured over four million dollars for his own only for his own pockets last year these are questions that need to be addressed because too many lives were lost unnecessarily at a time uh, when we could have done more when we could have invested ppe hire more staff make sure that these facilities hire more staff or transfer and isolated patients who had COVID-19, we completely went in the wrong direction. And I have you know, focused a lot of my pain and agony uh, into my role as a state lawmaker, as the chair of the Committee on Aging, to make sure that we get to the truth of what happened last year. And people like Andrew Cuomo are held accountable for the bad policies and decisions that led to unnecessary deaths. Uh, I hope that I can join you and the other families in continuing to pursue, continue to pursue that truth and hold uh, the governor accountable in the next several months to come. Thank you all, and I hope to see everybody very soon. Please 
leave your message for <clears throat> Right here, it's, it's always been peaceful. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, that's why I always came here. It was, it's like, it's like so somewhere you say, like a getaway spot. <laughs> so I, that's how I would call this, in a way, for me. That's why even when I left, I always came, always. You know, they, those are my peers, those are my neighbors. Like, we support each other. I wish I was there with them because a lot of them they can't they can't use their hands. So I was a lot helpful for everybody, me, me and a few others. I'm used to helping them out with a certain thing and they can't do it over or feel comfortable to ask somebody or feel trustworthy to ask somebody. It's like, damn, it's it's a smack in the face. When you young in the wheelchair, you look around, it's not many other young people that might be around you. So the very few that are around you, y'all, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna conversate, you're gonna, you're gonna have a connection, understanding of what's, what y'all been through, and share each other's experience, or so on and so forth, or share what you learned, or so. When it comes to these nursing homes and stuff, it's a community like any other community. You know what I'm saying? Whether young, whether old, whether elderly, whether short, whether strong, it's all a community. So everybody knows each other, or will look out for each other. You feel like it, as far as it being a year, like March 13th, gonna make that year mark of being like, like locked up. Like, how would you like? I know, like, what your mind is like? I already know. You know, you know, you try, you try to stay strong and stay positive and right. try other things to do to get your mind off of it. And mm -hmm. You know, you know, it's hard, but everything's so fast, but it's slow at the same time. This shit is mad different. Like being here, at Dolo, and it's like I'm, I'm looking at Cola. Like I see the windows, and I, I'm like, damn, like my people's just locked up. Like I can't even go and see them. At the end of the day, you gonna grow old. You can one day be walking and get struck by this, hit by a tree, anything, and you could be in a chair. You could be walking with a cane. You could be walking with a limp. Anything. And now you feel you in a position of having an understanding of like what people with disabilities, seniors, elders, historians is going through. My name is Kelly Motero. I am the Director of Nursing at Sin Simeon by the Sound in Greenport, New York. We are a 120-bed skilled nursing facility. Um, this pandemic has changed so many things for nursing and nursing homes in general um, in the world. San Simeon is truly blessed that we um, remained uh, COVID-free in our resident population for 10 months of this pandemic when so many other facilities were um, suffering devastating, like unimaginable devastating losses. Um, January 10th, a Sunday morning, we were doing routine uh, resident testing and I had six um, residents test positive on one unit, three sets of roommates. Um, it was probably one of the most devastating moments of my career um, and calling those families was the most heartbreaking thing um, I can remember doing in, in my nursing career. So I had to get myself together as a leader, um, regroup, uh, refocus. And now my goal wasn't to keep us COVID free like we did for 10 months. It was to contain and um, get it out as quick as possible. Um, and that's truly what my amazing staff did. Um, we contained it to one unit. Um, we wound up with 11 total residents get COVID um, in this outbreak. Um, and within three and a half to four weeks, we were back to being COVID free. 
this this pandemic has you know for my staff for my residents it's really um been very hard but um we're we're just lucky that you know the residents are our family so the staff has stepped up when the residents cannot be seen with their family as often as they used to be and you know we have become their family um, now, thankfully, visiting has started and it's wonderful to see. We have scheduled visitations. You can see the smile from under the mask. Their eyes light up, the tears flowing when they see each other. Um, it's just a moment that, um, you know, you never forget. Um, praying that hopefully soon life will go back to some sort of normal, especially for all my residents um, who, you know, miss out on so much at their age just truly, truly blessed and know that this pandemic has changed me in so many ways as a nurse. I will probably never be the same. Um, it's definitely taught me what is valuable in life. So I hope everyone remains safe and healthy and hopefully we can get back to whatever our new normal may be. Um, and everyone have a good day. Hello everyone. It is truly a privilege to join you today as we remember and grieve the loved ones we have lost to this terrible virus. While the last 14 months have included so many losses, the deaths which occurred in nursing homes have been among the most difficult to bear. In most cases, we were helpless as our isolated loved ones faced their final days. We were unable to hold their hands or comfort them directly with our presence. And then, already stricken by loss, we ourselves were also deprived of the most reliable source of comfort, other people. When without our usual gatherings and practices, we missed out on the healing effects of telling stories about our loved ones and the vital support of being with other people. Grief empties us. When we sit together, we literally borrow the energy of others and sometimes even their clarity and focus, which can help us get things done. The absence of our rituals has made the grieving process even harder than usual. Grief, we know, is a human experience. Some even say grief is the flip side of love, that we cannot have one without the other. But unlike love, which gives us energy and brings light and joy, grief seems to rob us of our own life force. We may lose our sense of pleasure or purpose, what am I if not my father's daughter, we may ask, or my aunt's caregiver? Grief affects us physically as much as it weighs on our emotional well-being. Sleeping and eating can be disrupted. Grief-heavy limbs may move slowly, and we may have the sensation of walking through molasses as we move through our days. And of course, for those of us who felt more relief than sorrow at the passing of someone with whom we've had tough times in our pasts, our experience may look different as we grieve not exactly for the person who died, but for the relationship we wish we had had. We know that grief is lifelong, and though it changes over time, there are no clear-cut stages, no obvious endings to our grief. How, we might wonder, can we ease our sorrows? I have six suggestions. Continue to tell the stories that mean the most to you about the deceased and about your relationship, about was and what never was. Two, connect with other people just to be together. Friends, neighbors, religious and spiritual communities can be accessed in all kinds of ways and it is good to be with others. Three, give yourself the gift of counseling or pastoral support. There are many free counseling services available for COVID-related relief online or on the phone, or even in your local areas. Four, I suggest that we give ourselves time outside in nature if possible with a walk or some exercise. Exposure to the seasons changes our chemistry. Sunshine actually changes our bodies and makes us feel better. Five, find something new to do. Learning a new skill or reading a new book, listening to a podcast will give your mind and body a break from your grief and will literally give yourself and your system a chance to reset and to heal. And finally, be patient with yourself. Like the cherry blossoms that have filled New York's parks over these last few weeks, color and joy will return, even as we hold our loved ones in our hearts. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Roxanne. 
Ruff Tomita from Pawilo, Hawaii, and I'm the daughter of Melvin Tomita, who passed away on September 4th, 2020. He was residing at Yukio um, Okutsu State Veterans Home in Hilo, and unfortunately he did die of COVID. Um, he went into the nursing home on June 17, 2019, and our family hoped that it was it would be a temporary rehabilitation. My dad um, enlisted in the U.S. Army and Hawaii National Guard on July 7, 1952, after he graduated Baldwin High School on Maui. And the following year, he also got married and had my brother. In 91, he retired from the Honolulu Fire Department, sitting county after 26 years about 26 and a half years as firefighter three, and he worked as fire engineer at Hawaii Kai Fire Station. He um, transferred to the U.S. Army Reserve 100 Battalion, 442nd Infantry, 29th Division um, at Schofield Barracks and was activated in May 1968 to Vietnam, where he worked as a cook on the front lines. His rank was Sergeant First Class. Um, he was a Bronze Star Medal recipient. And, you know, like a lot of Vietnam vets and also being American, um, Japanese American, he, it was difficult for him to identify and discuss his negative war traumas. I'll refer to the nursing home as Yukio. Um, Dad was the sixth out of 27 patients that died of COVID-19. At the time um, that he died, there were 46 residents and 12 staff that tested positive for COVID. The day before he passed, there was one death, then three more the following day. At Hilo Medical, there were eight residents on the COVID unit and two more in the ICU. It was a scary, tenuous time for us. I would jump every time the phone rang. And the hardest thing was that I couldn't be with my dad at the hospital. He was on the COVID unit with six other beds of patients from Yukio. The nurse was actually in the room with my dad and I was outside of the room looking in through a small window with the doctor while she was administering end of life medications and the nurse, she kept going back and forth. And so I actually texted a message to her and showed it to her. I knocked on the window and she came up and read it. And she whispered in my dad's ear that, you know, Roxanne said it was okay, daddy, you can go home to mom. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share my dad's personal story and to honor his life as well as to pay tribute to the memory of each and every life lost to COVID in this last year. It's impacted us all and it's still not over. Learning how to live with the virus has certainly become our way of life now and hopefully more opportunities like this will be available to help bring healing and to bridge our communities together as we continue to face what the future brings. What I miss the most about my dad is his cooking at parties, singing, playing ukulele, harmonica. He performed Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis Presley at my Yakudoshi, um, my 32nd birthday celebration on Maui. I just wanna say thank you and aloha from Hawaii to the Great Panthers for honoring you know, our kapuna our elderly that you know lived in nursing homes and got COVID. I truly appreciate it.
What was the pandemic like for me? The only word I could use to describe it was terrifying. I worked in long-term care my entire life, but I advanced my role to nursing home administrator in May of last year. My first day as an administrator was walking into a building and we were experiencing the first wave of COVID-19. How did you keep your life going through the pandemic? This year, I try, I'll be try best my residents, my, I do my best every single day. And I wanted to make sure that the family members would feel comfortable that I was right there by their side. I know it felt like if I was on their shoes, I probably would be like really, really mad because it's not fair. But um, I just, to me, it was very, very challenging. How did you keep yourself going through the pandemic? Really, it was through the books. I like to read, so that's how I got going, you know? I'm so happy to see this day today because we have gone a long way. I remember the first day when COVID started, the patient was positive. I went crazy because none of us know what um, the school week will do or what's going on. Uh, I think it was frustrating on a couple of levels. Of course, we all, as staff, we were tired of the mask and we were tired of the shield, but that was not as bad as the frustrations that uh, patients and family members and even staff family members would have. Must have been cold there in my shadow to never have sunlight on your face. You are content to let me shine that your way. You always walk the step behind. the one with all the glory while you are the ones with all the strength a beautiful face without a name for so long a beautiful smile to hide the
A year ago, April 2020, my younger sister, Anita, died. Not of COVID, it was cancer, pancreatic. It was indeed a messy time for her to be sick. An Atlanta hospital kept sending her home and she clearly needed around the clock medical care and attention. The beginning new pandemic anxiety. Sending her home to my 90 year old mother and 65 year old sister who tried their best to care for her. Her distracted doctor suggested we put her in a nursing home, a reasonable request at the time. Reluctantly, my family went shopping spent a couple weeks looking at various places, but ultimately they couldn't imagine her being that far away from home, isolated in a strange, seemingly sterile surround amongst other ill bodies and healthcare workers, strangers. No, my mother said, I will take care of her as best I can and she will be home. My mother could not take care of my sister. It was impossible. My sister developed septus and was rushed back to the hospital one last time, bypassing any and all of those nursing homes and the inevitable consequences. We said our stunned goodbyes on a cell phone, just like many other terrible, terrible goodbyes this past year. I was so angry at who and what it seemed impossible to fathom. I've been in Philadelphia since the pandemic in a charming neighborhood surrounded by nursing and rehabilitation centers, senior apartments, these places. Well kept and fading modernist buildings, some housed in enormous mansions from an earlier time in Quaker Germantown, Philadelphia. I imagine for a moment that I am shopping. Heroes work here, one large banner reads. It seems like the city cares yardmen tending the lawns and gardens. The buildings are quiet as their parking lots are full. I see a few healthcare workers on the street during the week coming and going from the different buildings and are from their cars. I try to connect my sight and heart, a look. From behind my own mask, I'm gonna tell them how grateful I am that they are doing their work, especially now, and how mysterious these places where they do this brave work appear to me. But they mostly look down at their cell phones or the ground before getting into their cars and driving away. A purposeful exhaustion, I suppose. I've never seen a patient on a street, a balcony, through a window, they are invisible. I can only imagine the aloneness, the fear, the debilitating solitude. Even as the healthcare workers care enough to die here, right alongside them. The dying. More of them dying because of COVID. Differently. All are profoundly missed. I think of my sister. She could have died in one of these places instead of a hospital. Invisibly, it would have made no difference. What a tragedy. My anger will have to do better. Hi, my name is Ron Fatula. Uh, I'm the principal of Ronald Fatula and Associates, and I am truly honored to sponsor this very important event. And uh, I'd like to thank the Great Panthers for all of the great work and advocacy that they've done over the years. My firm has lost so many clients to COVID this past year. Clients that have spent the last few weeks and even months of their lives in nursing homes alone trying to beat this awful, awful disease. Many people have experienced so much grief sadness, anxiety, and isolation during this past year due to the pandemic. I have personally had my own share of losses. I lost my own brother, who I love so much. He was my best friend, my confidant, my best buddy since birth. And he passed away last summer during the time of COVID. So this has been a very difficult time for me 
Uh, and knowing that my brother was in the hospital for the last five weeks of his life, alone, isolated, in extreme pain. Uh, and I, of course, think about him multiple times a day. In my law firm, we lost our wonderful and beloved receptionist of 18 years, Judy. Both Judy and her husband had COVID, went into the hospital together. Judy's husband passed away in the hospital, but Judy was sent to a nursing home and she passed away in the nursing home about two months later. She loved working in the office. She loved people. I'm sure that what I experienced is just not uncommon for many of you. Uh, we've all experienced multiple losses and we're trying to deal with the inability to see our loved ones when they're in the hospital or in a nursing home. They might be suffering, they're isolated, then they might have passed away. We know that we can't bring them back, but we can celebrate their lives and remember the great connection that we had with them. But I choose to remember the laughing the playing, the traveling that they've done, the stories that they told me, personally, the family outings, just hanging out together, the great conversations, all of this helps to soften the pain that I feel. Personally, I found that bereavement groups were very helpful to me and spiritual guidance and support, reading, meditating, staying busy, and boy, am I busy in my practice, and connecting with family, connecting with friends, and taking joy in new life that comes in. Uh, I now have a grandson on the way, and as odd as it may seem, uh, my brother passed away July 29th of 2020, and the due date for my new grandson, is July 29th, 2021, just one year later. All of this has truly helped me to cope. What I've learned over the last year is that grief is a process and everyone grieves in a different way. There's no right, there's no wrong. You just have to be kind to yourself, take care of yourself and know that However you grieve is the right way to grieve. The CDC recommends contacting 911 if you need help or if you're feeling overwhelmed or even if you're feeling suicidal. And they have many great tips and resources on their website. Don't be afraid. There is no stigma to reaching out and getting guidance from a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and even medication if you need it. Thank you so much to the Gray Panthers. Take care. I have a friend whose father died before he was born. Every year he goes to the cemetery, looks down at the grave, places a stone on the monument and says, Dad, I never knew you, but I will never forget you. Today, we recall with sadness the many whom we did not know, but all of whom were precious to their own families and to the greater human family. My own father died in a nursing home. I will always remember with much gratitude those angelic souls who provided such boundless care and compassion for him during that last chapter of life. Let us not forget the many health professionals who were there with their cell phones using FaceTime so that loved ones could talk to one another during a challenging time. Who can forget an elderly man standing with a sign in front of a nursing home and saying to his wife who suffered with dementia, you may not remember me, but I remember you and will always remember you. It is said that parting is such sweet sorrow Truthfully, I never understood that statement because every party is sorrowful. A familiar face will no longer be seen. A final farewell has to be spoken. But when we look back at that garden of life, 
and remember all of the special moments we share with people who so meant so much to us, I think we realize, yes, there is sorrow today, but there is also such a thing as sweet sorrow. Amen. Maggie Kuhn, an inspiration back in the day, remains an inspiration for all of us today as well. She was a founder of Grey Panthers and one of the leading activists in the 20th century. Her voice, her comments, her legacy continue to inspire millions. And one of the things that she found most important to address was the issue of nursing homes. What, what we need to do is to come together to honor the people who are in nursing homes and to understand that Maggie's vision needs to be continued and needs to be made central to the future. All of us are together here because we've all been suffering through this terrible pandemic. We know that almost 200,000 nursing home residents have passed. Whether or not there's going to be a lot more, we don't know. But we also are, have to be 1,000% assured that we will continue to honor, grieve, and to seek improvements. We decided that the issues of nursing home, COVID, and death needed to be addressed because we all need to grieve. When we want to ensure that improvements can be made. We know they can be, and we also know that work is commencing on that. The nursing home sector needs a lot of work. We want to share our ability and our love so that we can work toward those things. We've listened to so many moving testimonials and we've been able to better understand how nursing home residents, staff and families have expressed their humanity and their need to grieve. Now, what are we gonna do about all that? It would be really great if we can create some positive action from that. We really appreciate if each one of you would become part of the Grey Panthers Honoring Nursing Home Lives initiative. We wanna be the catalyst for change. We know that that's just an opportunity that all of us can take. Whether it's small or big, we would love for you to be joining with us. We can take a concrete pathway to improvements. Our sponsors are Riverside Church and Ron Fatula Associates. We want to be able to say thank you, not only to our sponsors, but also to everybody who's been working on this project. They put their heart and soul into it. And we want to make sure that this has been a memorable opportunity for everybody for now and for positive change in the future. Just thanks so much.